Let's talk about delivering help after Harvey. The president says it is a top priority. Do you have a plan to avoid the politics that got in the way of the Sandy money? We hope that everybody puts politics aside to get help directly to the people in a speedy fashion. I mean, we know, Chris, after the devastating effects of a storm like Harvey, that the recovery, the rebuilding, the relief efforts, they go on uh, infinitely. Uh, sometimes it feels like uh, we don't know if it'll be weeks, months, years. But this president and vice president and cabinet stand ready to assist those in need. Um, housing will be an issue for many people who are displaced. Their houses are either uninhabitable or destroyed. We know that we've been trying to get food and water to people, over two and a half million meals, um, over two million liters of water as of yesterday, perhaps, perhaps more today, clothing. We know um, that non-governmental organizations are also helping a great deal. The media are helping to connect people with information. We're grateful for that. But in terms of the funding, we hope that Congress will focus on the president's priority, which is to connect the people in need with the money and the, and the resources that they require to get immediate help, but also to help rebuild their lives. That's why I ask about the plan. I get the intentions, and it's the right intention, especially in this type of emergency situation. But, you know, the cabinet itself is filled with lawmakers who voted against that Sandy money. What will the president do if people play politics with Harvey the way they did with Sandy? Chris, the president has also said he needs to rely on Congress. We hope it'll be bipartisan in nature. So few things in this city have been since uh, we arrived in January. We can't seem to get many Democrats at the table for big, meaningful initiatives, and that's very disappointing. Can't have a conversation, let alone a vote on certain things. But we hope when it comes to relief that the plan will include Democrats and Republicans voting to get that relief. Um, it should also really focus on the task at hand. Right. which is about Harvey and those in the affected areas. So Congress comes back. Um, in the meantime, the president has uh, provided, the administration, frankly, is working to coordinate with our local state uh, officials and also the rest of the administration to access the resources and the capital that we need to provide folks with, uh, with their immediate relief. So he's going to have to get the Republicans in line because they're the ones that blocked the Sandy money last time, Ted Cruz, Ryan, and others. And... He's going to have to rethink the FEMA money, isn't he? I mean, making cuts to FEMA and allocating money to the wall. What's the main priority, Harvey or the wall? Well, well, Chris, that's not very fair. And I heard you three times in a row get the same soundbite out. So let me reply in kind. Uh, oh, the same question to just to get a me, response. When it came that's to Hurricane all. Sandy, you know. No, that's not fair. I answered your question twice. I'll do it a third time. But if you're going to talk about who voted for and against Hurricane Sandy, you have to be fair and reflect the full remarks of the people who say that they voted against what they wanted to vote for, hurricane relief, but they voted against what they saw as a pork-laden bill that included yeah. many other things. I saw one was for a, a car for an inspector general, another was to revamp uh, some, some building. But they, this is about getting money to the people. Right, the but that just wasn't a in the last valid two days, premise. Hold on. The, the president in the last two days was asked in different ways about money, and he has both times said he thinks it should be separate. In other words, he thinks that we really should focus on the task at hand here. And that's Democrats and Republicans, He by has the said way. the right thing. I, I am in no well, way criticizing what the, right the president has said. He will do the right thing. He will I'm, do the right I'm thing. I'm not suggesting he won't. I'm suggesting that he's got to get the GOP in line because those senators who said it was pork-laden, like Ted Cruz, were wrong. They were playing politics, and that's why Cruz had to change his position after getting three Pinocchios. It wasn't pork laden. Almost all of that money was Sandy related. Listen to Governor Chris Christie, a Republican, as we all know. He says they were playing politics, they were cheap, and they were wrong. So I'm asking, how does the president avoid that happening again? So I've answered that already, and I think you're playing politics now with something like a tragedy in Harvey. I answered your question. The money will be there. We hope that Republicans and Democrats will come together and not politicize this. We see a lot of politics being played. I think instead of having the same conversation five different ways over the course of the first three or four minutes of this interview, you could be putting up 1-800 numbers or websites or giving people information about diapers or pet rescue we can do or meals or water. We well, can do you're both. not, though. You're not, no, though. You actually, guys have we are. Actually, actually we use social you media. You the people away and, what, what and, and, and put something up. You've, have I'm you seen this show? You could take two of the seats away from a panel 
and put information up that Leanne, people in let's, need let's actually stick to the facts. actually require. Let's so stick yeah, to here's the facts. the facts. This president isn't just saying the right thing; he will do the right thing. And I'm and saying, let's hope that in Congress order for him together. to do it, Congress has to come together. And we saw yeah, the no intention kidding. with Sandy, and they didn't get it done. Donald Trump, then citizen Trump, rightly criticized the Obama administration and Congress for not getting the money done for Sandy because they played politics. That's what I'm saying. You don't have to be defensive about the president. I'm not calling I'm not him out. At all. I'm saying, how does he control Congress? I don't Congress? feel defensive at all, except for the people in need. So my focus is on them. And that's my an urgency. My focus is on the people who are affected now. That's right. Not not something you want to politicize from five years but ago. But that's my, what my, happened. My concern are the 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 women and the children and the families right. and the destroyed of homes course. and the people. Who stand? Who are in a very different situation than they were just a week of ago? Of course, and that's why and Chris sisters, Christie. And we're here to help them. And that's why Chris Christie's making the rounds on television, saying in full-throated fashion, "Don't do it again. You took 60-something days to approve the money because you played politics and you wanted budget set-offs, and it wasn't a clean bill. Avoid those problems this time." That's all I'm saying. That's not disrespecting the survivors. That is respecting the survivors and making sure that they don't get caught up in political mishigas like happened the last time. That's my point. Okay. We agree. Shocking. All right, let's move on to something else. The, one of the themes that's coming out of this, and it's not a discussion just to have now, but certainly in the weeks and months as we move forward, is whether or not what happened in Harvey and why it's happening and why these storms happen open up a discussion about the role of climate change. Is the president, is the administration open to that conversation? Chris, we're trying to help the people whose lives are literally underwater and you want to have a conversation about climate change. I mean, that is, I'm, I'm not going to engage in that right now because I work for a president and a vice president and a country that is very focused on helping the millions of affected uh, Texans and, God forbid, Louisianans, if, if, if it ends up. Um, Imagine if we could find ways there. to reduce the number of these storms. Imagine if we could figure out why a hundred year storm seems to happen every other year. I mean, you have all these gonna, scientists saying climate change is part of the tonight? equation. It's, okay, it's just a, what. It's a question about whether we'll or not the assume, administration is open. It seems the answer is we'll, no. We'll assume, we'll assume. No, I didn't say that, Chris. And you, you don't need you, to put words in my mouth. Well, you I berated me for, for asking the question and made it sound as if I weren't caring about the situation. No, I think the cause the of the storm matters. The con I'm exposing the irony of the conversation. Here's the deal. You play amateur climatologist tonight, and I will play professional helper to those in need and, and continue in my job here as counsel to the president to help listen to the cabinet members, the president, the vice president, FEMA, um, DHS and others, General Kelly, who could not be a better chief of staff equipped for a matter like Harvey since he was at DHS mm -hmm. and is accustomed to large scale operations as such. And, and I will, and we're gonna talk to the governors of the two states and the locally elected officials and the NGOs and non-governmental organizations the faith-based groups, the volunteers on the ground, neighbor to neighbor, stranger to stranger rescuing each other. I'm going to focus on them uh, for in the short term, perhaps the long term, because I literally see people, I see pregnant women, in, including on your channel, who are in need, who say they're shivering or their mm -hmm. kids are hungry or they're worried about their belongings or they had to leave their pets behind. Can somebody rescue them or they haven't heard from an elderly relative? That's what I'm going to do. Good. That's what we're going to do here. You should. But it doesn't mean that you do that to the exclusion of questions of why storms happen. At some point, that could be part of the conversation. I asked about it. You gave an answer. Sure, I'll come we'll back to on. talk about that. I'll, I'll come back to talk about that. Um, right now, I know that many Houstonians and, and those living in and around that city um, were either uninsured or underinsured. They're facing a lack of housing. They're, they're exhausted. They're frustrated. They're worried about family members and friends they have not heard from. They're worried about elderly relatives mm -hmm. that they have not seen. So we're going to look at the, the human factor for quite a while now. Good. Now, if you want to talk about issues also in the news, we could talk about, oh, the president's uh, play at historic tax reform today in Missouri, Route 66, the heart of uh, American manufacturing and, and America's gateway to the West at one point, mm -hmm. where he has promised to simplify the tax code that we spend billions of billions of hours and dollars trying to comply with it every year. Mm -hmm. You've got the stupid instruction page uh, for the simple form is over 200 pages long. That's just the instruction page. 
we have 94% uh, or so of Americans and 91% of small business owners either do fill out that form themselves with software packages or right. pay someone else to help them do it. We're spending, we're losing millions of jobs, it's costing us millions of jobs, trillions of dollars, and billions of hours. Will the tax plan benefit the middle class, the working yes, class, equally yes. as it does the upper class? It is a middle class tax cut. What and does it that mean? also, we have to, well, here's what it means. I'm glad you asked. Uh, this is basically like getting a pay raise for many middle class Americans, middle income earners, I should say. Where we're reducing their marginal rate, but we're also reducing the rate on small business owners and entrepreneurs who are already suffering under the yoke of Obamacare, which of course was one of the biggest job killers and tax raisers in modern history. In addition to that uh, regulation they've had to overcome, they, they are now taxed in a way that hurts their productivity and their ability to attract and retain the American workforce, expand their operations, survive and prosper. There are four major goals here. One is to do exactly that, make our job creators more competitive around the globe. You know, um, other countries saw how low our corporate tax rate was and how well we were doing for years and they wised up to that and they went and lowered their corporate tax rate and we increased ours. These are the folks who are creating jobs, who are reinvesting right, those Right, but you know the corporate tax workers. rate is different than when we're hold dealing on. with the working class. That's one point. You well, want to no, reduce their taxes, small, Excuse me, small business fine. owners, no, 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 small business owners though are, are the forgotten men and forgotten women. Absolutely. And what, and what they can do, I was a small business owner for 21 years before I took this job, Chris. What I would have done with that kind of reduction in rate, you reinvest it right back into the company. You hire another person or two. You buy better supplies and inventory. You, you, you move to a better, a better facility. There's and, no question so, you can incentivize them. I'm just saying can. that the corporate tax rate, small business owners don't pay that, right? If they're in an LLC or an S-Corp or a pass-through, their filing is individuals. So the more you can do for their individual rate, the better. Correct. I'm saying the corporate rate, you know, what it is nominally versus what it is effectively is a big difference. If you get rid of all the loopholes, then you can play Correct. with the rate. But until that's you do right. that, you're doing nothing. That's right. And thank you for mentioning that. The part of the simplification is going from this, you know, thousands of pages of nonsense and complying since the IRS is probably one of the biggest Loch Ness monsters here in the swamp is getting the IRS off the yokes of many American taxpayers because they are they live in fear of of not complying properly so they spend all this money all this time doing that simplifying also means getting rid of these loopholes and these sops to special interests and swamp dwellers because frankly cur the current tax code benefits many of the wealthy because that's they can afford sure. attorneys and accountants and lobbyists to help them pay next to nothing or nothing that's in right. taxes. So let's get rid of a lot of those, those loopholes and a lot of those special interest uh, SOPs, if you will. The other thing that we're going to do is make our country more competitive and also repatriate so many of these funds. We've got so much wealth parked in other countries because we have made it prohibitive and companies are doing that legally. We've made it prohibitive for them to retain and reinvest their profits and their money into our own country. We want to bring back jobs, we want, including manufacturing jobs, and we, we want to bring back that wealth that's been parked in other countries. You do that here, and you couple that with what the president has already done, Chris, with respect to deregulation, what he's done in, in, in unleashing energy, the investments that he's making in infrastructure, wants to make an in infrastructure, mm -hmm. another, I would hope, nonpartisan or bipartisan issue. We'll see. And, and then we're talking. You've got uh, the president today in Missouri. You've got Vice President Pence tonight in West Virginia at the Chamber of Commerce, where he is, right. will be joined by Good. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. We hope he has his vote. He's joined by the new Republican governor, Governor Justice of West Virginia, who just a month it's ago was a Democrat. Discussion. It's an important discussion for both sides. We know that right now we're in the phase of the president wanting to frame the debate and that the how will come later, and we'll assess it when it does. Let me ask you about a couple other things. One. Uh, what is going to happen with DACA? And we know we're waiting on that. And I ask you in a different context than normal. One of the things we're seeing coming out of Harvey is they are not checking uh, for documentation right now because the exigency is on safety and just making sure as many people get as help as possible. We have not heard the president um, criticize that move, that leniency right now. And I'm wondering if that plays in to any of his philosophy about what to do with DACA because these kids who then become adults in this country are a very vulnerable group. What's the thinking on it? Well, a few things on DACA. The Congress had all year to act. Uh, a legislative 
fix or some clarity would be helpful. But on the matter of DACA, the president has expressed um, sympathy for many of the so-called dreamers, what they refer to themselves as dreamers. And the, he's also made very clear that he wants an immigration system that respects the law and that is fair, fair to everyone involved. And, and let me just back up, because I think that Donald Trump, as a candidate and now as president, took issues that really were mired in the low single digits in everybody's polling. Mm -hmm. um, illegal immigration, trade, for example. And he, he talks about them through the lens of fairness, but fairness to all. So for years, the big debate was, what's fair to the illegal immigrant? What more can we do for them or give to them? And Donald Trump said as a candidate, well, but what's fair to the American worker with whom they're competing um, for that particular job? What's but the fair data disputes that premise, by the way. But, no, Chris, come on. What's They're just it, go, not the jobs. The They're just not the jobs that Americans are looking for and doing. That's not that what undocumented a, people are doing. Excuse me. By the way, that is a very elite, effete argument. No, it isn't. And How many people to, no, do you know that want jobs picking vegetables many, and cleaning uh, homes? By the way, many, because I grew up in, in the, the part of New industry. Jersey. Excuse me. I grew up in the part of New Jersey. You walked right into that one, because I actually walked. I, I grew anything. up in the part of New Jersey that gives it the nickname the Garden State and worked on a farm myself for eight summers. There are many Americans who will do what immigrants and, and American-born citizens have done for years. Those aren't the jobs that the do working what they class have to do, needs. Do what they have to do to support themselves and their families. But Undocumented let me, let me, immigrants aren't what's keeping wages down. They're not what's taking the good jobs away from American workers. There's a reason that Mar-a-Lago has to go outside the country to get service workers. You know, there's a demand for that kind of labor, right or wrong. It's existed for a long time. So the question becomes, how do you balance respect for the law and enforcement of that law? And you have two very different opinions. You had Trump during the campaign who said, we're going to be a hammer. We're going to be a hammer. We're going to get them all out. And once he learned more about these people and how they manifest themselves in this country, especially the dreamers, he said, this is really hard. I got to figure it out. They should rest easy. And I'm wondering where his head is now. Well, that's what leaders do, though. Leaders listen to many different insights and inputs and contrasting opinions. The president surrounds himself with people of that, uh, of that nature. But at the same time, I want to remind you, he has never backed down from the fact that this is a country, it's a nation, it's a sovereign nation that must have borders that are respected and that we have spent billions of dollars over the years helping other nations protect their own borders. And many Americans agree with him that it's high time we respect our own. I would mention a couple other things, though. This president's very committed to workforce development and labor overall. He, uh, about two months ago, invested $100 million and directed his secretary of labor and others and is working with governors. I sat in one meeting with Democratic and Republican governors and members of the cabinet where they talked about workforce development. They talked about what are the needs the job creators came here to. What are the needs of our modern economy? What is it that we, what are the skill sets and the tools that are necessary? And, and we're listening to that. And he's, this apprenticeship program that he has put his full force and effect behind, as has Ivanka Trump in her capacity here as senior advisor, it's incredibly heartening because the folks that you grew up, the, the, some of the folks you grew up with in Queens, I grew up with in South Jersey, these are folks who don't go to college but who can graduate from high school or a community college with a skill certificate and they can become carpenters, welders, plumbers. They are a very vital, important part of our economy, Chris, and they can support themselves and their families on day one. The trades, the trades are real. There's no question about it. They need encouragement just the way college does. And it also makes the point about what kinds of jobs are really needed and what the real threat of these new immigrants are. Uh, we're out of time. Kellyanne, I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. There's always very a much. sequel for you and me. Thanks, Chris. Good to know. You're Take always care. welcome here to talk about Thank what you, matters. Sir. Be well and stay safe. God bless.